Good afternoon. It's good to have you in our second uh, lesson regarding angelology. And of course, uh, the last lesson we introduced angelology, and uh, we actually qu talked quite a bit about it. We mentioned the fact that angel, uh, the word angel, the Greek word angelos, uh, means a messenger, and that's what an angel is. They are a messenger. We also talked about the different classifications of angels found in the Bible. Of course, uh, uh, there is the generic term of just angels, and those are messengers uh, of God that, uh, that God uses uh, uh, for uh, basically announcing the different things that he does. There are the cherubim, and we went into quite a bit of detail on them, and uh, they are those vindicators of God's righteousness. They are the guardians to the throne, uh, the ones that kind of uh, do the bidding of the Lord uh, when he moves in, in great ways. And then we mentioned uh, the seraphim, and they are the attendants of the throne. They are the ones that give worship to God day and night, uh, constantly saying, holy, holy, holy. And uh, so we mentioned that and uh, kind of just briefly talked about what angels uh, do and their different tasks. Today we are in 8.2, and I do trust that you are uh, continuing to work on your Bible uh, verses. That is uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. And verse 19, and of course, uh, we'll be having that verse quiz uh, really after this lesson. And so we do need to get that done. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 through 6 and verse 19. Uh, but we are in 8.2 in our books. And uh, the title of this lesson are the names and titles of specific angels. And so we see that uh, there are, uh, we talked about classifications of angels uh, in the last lesson. And uh, now we're going to talk about specific angels. There are a few angels that are mentioned by name, and uh, they are specific uh, personalities here. Notice the first one here, uh, Lucifer, and uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. And of course, that is the name of Satan. Uh, before he fell from heaven, uh, his name was Lucifer. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? All right, so we see here that uh, Satan is named uh, as Lucifer, really calls him an angel of light. Uh, a lot of people believe that he was a very bright and beautiful angel. In fact, uh, we mentioned in the last lesson that he was of the classification of cherubim, and uh, it described uh, what he looked like, had all kinds of precious stones that uh, were on him. And uh, the Ezekiel passage also mentions the fact that he has pipes that were in him. Uh, many people believe that maybe uh, Lucifer was uh, the angel in charge of the music of heaven because he had musical pipes really uh, built into him. He was a very musical angel. And it might be very much so why uh, uh, Satan uses music today. Uh, very effectively to uh, get uh, Christians off track uh, because he is a musical angel. So we see here uh, Satan. Of course, uh, he fell and uh, became the leader of uh, the demons that, uh, that are against God. But he is specifically mentioned by name. Notice uh, the next angel. And uh, we mentioned Lucifer in the last chapter, but uh, do write this name down. Uh, you're familiar with it. Michael. Michael, and put next to him the archangel, Michael the archangel. And uh, we get that from Jude, verse 9. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. All right, so uh, Michael is mentioned. Uh, the word Michael means one who is like God. All right, and so uh, we see that uh, Michael is, uh, is considered an archangel. In fact, he is the only one that has the designation of an archangel. Now, sometimes people will uh, try to say, well, Lucifer was an archangel, and Gabriel, who we're going to mention here in a minute, is an archangel. The Bible does not call them archangels. So, um, you know, you know I, I'm not saying that maybe they're not, but uh, the Bible does not give them that title. We do know that Satan was of the class of cherubim, and so that is kind of a different classification. 
and it never mentions Gabriel being an archangel. Uh, it is kind of interesting that the Bible says uh, that when Christ comes back, it's the voice of the archangel. It doesn't say a archangel. It's the voice of the archangel. And uh, so very much the definite article there uh, dealing with the fact that there's only one. And so uh, we tend to believe that there is only one archangel, and uh, that is Michael. There are not multiple archangels. Uh, we see that Michael is kind of the leader of the angelic host, and he is very much a warrior uh, type angel. In fact, uh, let's look at let's look at uh, a passage here that has him in there. Turn to Revelation chapter twelve. Revelation chapter twelve. And we see a, uh, and we'll talk more about this uh, in uh, the eschatology chapter, but Revelation chapter 12 uh, is kind of a special chapter in Revelation. It's kind of an overview chapter, uh, kind of starts back from the beginning of history and it goes all the way to the end, kind of in one chapter. And we see that in this chapter, there is a war in heaven. And uh, Satan and his angels uh, are, are attacking heaven, all right? And notice, uh, uh, look with me at verse uh, number 7. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought against his angels. Of course, the dragon is Satan here. And prevailed not, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so we see that Michael, the archangel, is in charge of the angelic hosts that fight this battle. And by the way, this is not the battle, this is not when Satan fell from heaven. Uh, this is actually a battle that will take place in the end times. Um... Right now, uh, you know, some people uh, are actually shocked. I, I used to always think it was kind of common knowledge until I taught this at a church one time, and everybody was kind of a, a little shocked. Uh, Satan does have access to God. In fact, uh, the Bible indicates in, in a couple of different passages that Satan goes, in a sense, to, to heaven and tattletales on us. He is the accuser of the brethren. In fact, we see in Job chapter 1, Bible says that Satan presented himself before God with the other angels in heaven. And uh, God said to him, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And, and of course, we know the, the conversation that God and Satan had there about that. And so Satan currently is allowed to go uh, back and forth from heaven to earth. And uh, he reports to God about all the, the, the wicked things that we do. He tattletales on us. But there will come a day in the end times, where God says enough, I don't want him to come anymore. I don't want him to come into heaven anymore. I don't want to hear him anymore. I don't want to hear his sneers and his accusations. And there's going to be a war. And Satan's going to bring his angels up there uh, right in the middle of the tribulation time. And uh, he's going to fight. And Michael, and the archange, uh, Michael the archangel and his angels will fight against Satan and his angels. And he's going to throw them out of heaven. And Satan will be barred for heaven, from heaven forever. And that's going to be sure a wonderful, wonderful time. But it's Michael, the archangel. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Michael uh, has been uh, very much uh, an active uh, angel. We see that uh, there is kind of almost a special relationship between Michael, the archangel, and the nation of Israel. Notice in verse number 1, it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and at that time, this is at the end times, shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a, a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that should be found written in the book. And so a really description of the end times, a uh, description of the second coming, the fact that Israel will be delivered, of course, that second coming, uh, the Lord will come back uh, with his angels, all right, to, to administer ju judgment. Now, we know that the voice of the archangel happens at the rapture. It does also happen at the second coming. Matthew chapter 24, 
uh, talks about uh, the archangel sounding off, all right? And so uh, we see that Michael is instrumental in that. I was going to show you one other passage. Uh, look with me in Daniel uh, chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. And just kind of give you that warrior nature of Michael. We see in chapter 10, and we don't want to read the whole chapter, but Daniel prays to God for some understanding of some visions that he had had. And uh, in verse number two, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. All right, so he was fasting for 21 days, seeking understanding about this vision and praying and asking God uh, that, that he would uh, show him uh, what these things mean. Now, this is kind of interesting because we see a little bit of really what is out there, spiritual warfare going on. Some things that we don't necessarily always notice. Notice uh, an angel does come and speak to Daniel. Uh, it describes the angel in, in verses 5 and 6. And in verse 7 it says, And I, Daniel, uh, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a, qua a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled and hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my uh, comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face towards the ground. Uh, uh, Daniel passed out from this. Uh, he, there was so much, you might say, fear. And uh, verse 10, And behold, uh, an hand touched me and set me up on my knees, upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken the, uh, this word unto me, I stood trembling. Now notice this passage, verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So the angel said, Look, the first day you started praying, God heard your prayer, and God dispatched me to, uh, to answer that prayer. But notice what happens here. Look at verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Now remember last lesson we talked in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. It called Satan the king of Tyrus. Well, we kind of got the same thing going on here. We've got the prince of Persia here. We're not really talking about a uh, literal uh, human being here. We're talking about, uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, that angels, that that, that uh, demons, there's principalities and powers, all right? Uh, the idea of principalities are, you might say that Satan has, a, you know, an army, an organized army, and uh, there are some uh, uh, demons that, that are leaders of others. And here we see that this angel was dispatched to answer the prayer of Daniel. And he met some resistance here. In verse 13, it says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. So for 21 days, he was stuck fighting against this prince of Persia, this uh, demonic uh, uh, angel that uh, was, was prohibiting him from getting to Daniel uh, to, to deliver the message uh, that God had for him. But notice this, uh, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the king of Persia. So we see here that, uh, that this angel actually gets the help of Michael the archangel. And Michael comes in and frees him up so he can go and deliver the message to Daniel. You know, uh, it really does give us a little bit of insight into some of the spiritual warfare that goes on. Maybe you've been praying for something for a while, and you say, I just don't know why the, the answer's not coming right away. Well, the truth is, is maybe it is on its way. And uh, maybe the devil is fighting it a little bit. Maybe he's uh, causing a little bit of interference. We see here in this passage, at least, uh, that there was some interference by the devil in, in, uh, in the answer of one of Daniel's prayers. 
And uh, it took Michael the archangel coming and fighting so that this angel could go and uh, deliver the message there. So we see um, that, uh, that Michael the archangel is uh, a warrior angel. In fact, Jude verse 9, we mentioned that uh, last week, uh, that uh, it, it mentions the, the fact, in fact, we read it just a minute ago, uh, that Michael the arch- archangel disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. And I don't know all the ins and outs of what exactly uh, Satan wanted with the body of Moses. Some people think that maybe uh, Satan would have liked to have possessed the dead body of Moses and tried to lead Israel astray. I don't know about that. Uh, some people, and I'm one of them, that tend to think that maybe uh, Moses may be one of the two witnesses later on in the book of Revelation, which we'll talk about in eschatology. And uh, maybe uh, Satan was trying to interrupt that, that process. Nonetheless, uh, Michael the archangel disputed with, with Satan over that. And so we see that he very much is a warrior angel, and he is the only one mentioned as an archangel. Notice it right down the, the, the next angel here, Gabriel. Gabriel. And Gabriel, once again, it just classifies him as an angel. He is definitely a messenger angel. I tend to think that he's probably the leader of the messenger angels. Um, you know, we mentioned the different classification of angels and that some of them were messengers. Uh, I tend to think that Gabriel probably is the leader in that uh, Gabriel is seen delivering some of the most important messages uh, during some of the most instrumental times in history. Uh, notice, of course, Gabriel, as we think about him, the one who delivered the message to Mary, uh, Mary that she was going to have the Messiah, Jesus. Notice your book mentions uh, Luke 1, 26 and 27. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So we see uh, that Gabriel... Uh, tells Mary that she's going to have uh, Jesus. By the way, Gabriel is also the one that told uh, her cousin, Elizabeth, that uh, that she would have a son, John the Baptist. And so uh, we see, uh, actually, uh, he told uh, Zacharias uh, about the, the son. And, of course, Zacharias didn't believe him. And because of that, uh, Zacharias uh, couldn't speak until John the Baptist was born. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Gabriel was that messenger angel. All right? And... Um, and Gabriel has been around for uh, several events and several prophecies. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Uh, we mentioned uh, already Michael in being involved in the book of Daniel. But uh, Gabriel as well is mentioned in the book of Daniel. Look at Daniel chapter 8. And uh, <clears throat> look with me at... Uh, Verse number 15, it says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eli, uh, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. All right, so we see that Gabriel is the one who uh, explains that vision to Daniel. By the way, it very possibly is Gabriel the one that maybe that Michael came to help. Uh, you know, uh, we mentioned earlier on, all right? So, uh, and by the way, that was a very, uh, uh, very important vision there. I think that was the vision uh, that talked about Antiochus Epiphanes, who uh, did so much against the Jews uh, later on in history and was very much a type of the Antichrist. Uh, and it was Gabriel that uh, delivered that message. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, by the way, uh, Gabriel delivers uh, another message, uh, another prophecy to Daniel, and that's Daniel 70 weeks, probably one of the greatest prophecies and one of the most detailed, minute prophecies in, in Scripture, uh, Daniel 70 weeks, that was given by Gabriel. Notice letter D and write this one down, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, write it down. Now, maybe you've not thought about this before, but the, the, the phrase, the angel of the Lord, appears in the Bible quite a few times. In fact, I think in the book of Judges alone, it, I think it occurs, I believe, 80 times. 
All right. Uh, and uh, it, it's true that uh, the angel of the Lord could refer simply to a, a good angel. And we do see uh, some of that. All right. Uh, we see several events in which the angel of the Lord appears. Uh, the angel of the Lord is, it appears to Hagar. Remember when she was uh, uh, out there ready to die and uh, the angel of the Lord appears. Uh, the angel of the Lord's the one that stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. It says the angel of the Lord uh, promised Abraham many descendants. Uh, the angel of the Lord was uh, the spokesman for the three men that appeared to Abraham when they told him about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the angel of the Lord that did the speaking there. The angel of the Lord, uh, your book mentions, appeared to Jacob. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It says specifically, the angel of the Lord. Uh, it was the angel of the Lord that blocked the road for Balaam. Remember when the donkey spoke to Balaam? And it was the angel of the Lord with, the, with his sword drawn? So we see there, there is this angel of the Lord. And, uh, and I believe, and I think uh, most preachers probably believe this as well, that the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. All right. Of course, we know the word angel is angelos, a messenger. And um, although it does not uh, specifically uh, say that Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord, uh, I think there are some very good reasons why the angel of the Lord is uh, what we call a theophany of Christ. And, and go ahead and write that term down. Uh, theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, a theophany. And you need to know that term. And that is, uh, write it down, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, what does the word pre-incarnate mean? Uh, of course, carne deals with, uh, you know, in the flesh, or all right? A pre-incarnate would be before the flesh. The idea of pre-incarnate uh, means before Jesus was born. So really what we have is an appearance of Jesus Christ before he was born in Bethlehem's manger. And we know that Jesus Christ did appear in the Old Testament. Of course, uh, we know that in the fiery furnace, right? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what did Nebuchadnezzar say? I see a fourth man in there, and he's like the Son of God. Well, that was a pre-incarnate, a theophany of Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, we tend to believe that the angel of the Lord is one of these theophanies, all right? And I'm going to give you several reasons for it. So write this down. Under reasons, the angel of the Lord is likely Jesus Christ. And reasons, the angel of the Lord is likely Jesus Christ. All right? And you do need to know these, so please make sure you do write them down. All right? Number one. Number one reason. Notice your book says, the angel of the Lord is occasionally designated as deity. The angel of the Lord is occasionally designated as deity. Notice Judges chapter 2, verse 1. It says, and an angel of the Lord, uh, and then it goes on to say, said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I, br and I brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers, and said, I will never break my covenant with you. Notice these are things that God did, and yet it's the angel of the Lord that's saying he did these things. Uh, of course, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 shows us that. I, the Lord, thy God, have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So uh, God claims to have done this, and yet in the Judges passage, it mentions the angel of the Lord claiming this. Okay? Uh, number two. Write it down. Number two. The angel of the Lord has the prerogative of forgiveness of sins. Basically, it means he can forgive sins. Now, we know that only... God can forgive sins, but in these in this passage we we see where it apparently it's the angel of the Lord that that is doing the forgiving here. Look at uh, your book there, Exodus chapter twenty three, verses twenty and twenty one. It says, "Behold, I send an angel before thee, to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him, and obey his voice. Provoke him not." For he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. And I think that's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty telling passage there. He talks about him, in a sense, being able to pardon sins or not pardon sins. And then God specifically says that his, God's name is in 
this angel. And so very, very likely, once again, the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Notice uh, the third one here. Write it down, number three. The angel did not discourage Balaam's worship. The angel of the Lord actually received worship. Now, we know that uh, angels do not receive worship. Uh, you think about many times in the Bible where, uh, uh, you know, an angel said, stand up. Uh, for I, you know, I'm not uh, worthy to be worshipped. Uh, but notice uh, in the story of Balaam, look at Numbers, your, your, your book has there, Numbers 22, verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and a sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. We see that position of worship there. And uh, yet the angel of the Lord didn't tell him to get up off his face. Uh, notice your book points out that men cannot receive worship. Uh, of course, Peter with Cornelius, when Cornelius tried to bow down and, and start praying to Peter, Peter said, stand up, stand up, I'm, I'm a man. I'm a man as well. Notice your book mentions angels cannot receive worship. In Revelation chapter 22, uh, we see that John falls down, John the Apostle falls down before an angel. And uh, notice at the end of uh, your book there, it mentions, uh, see, see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. And it goes on to say, worship God. So the angel says, get up. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fellow servant of God. Don't worship me. Worship God. All right. Uh, only Christ, your book mentions, can, can receive worship. Of course, Jesus on several occasions received the worship of man. Uh, your book mentions Matthew 14, 33, uh, the fact that they worshiped him. And yet we see in the case of Balaam uh, that apparently the angel of the Lord received worship as well. And so we tend to think that he is uh, a pre-incarnate, a theophany of Jesus Christ. Number four, notice it says the angel's actions, number four, the angel's actions are considered God's actions. Uh, look, uh, look in your book there, Zechariah chapter one, uh, part of verse 19 and 20. Uh, notice it says, and I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these, all right? So there's a vision that's given to Zechariah. Zechariah asks the angel of the Lord, what are these? What, what, is, what is this that I'm seeing? And then notice the, the reply here, and it says, and the Lord, by the way, that's all capitalized, that's Jehovah God, showed me four carpenters. And so he asked the angel of the Lord, what, what, what are these? And Jehovah answers and tells him what it is. And so we, we see that where, where apparently uh, the angel of the Lord is, is called uh, God, all right, or considered God, all right? So uh, you do want to know those four things there. Uh, once again, uh, four things of why we, we tend to believe that the angel of the Lord uh, is pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ. And when you see that phrase, you ought to look at it and say, uh, you know, um, you know that, that may be Jesus there in this situation. Kind of a neat thing there. Notice uh, the, your book also mentions the fact that the work of the Lord is attributed to this angel. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited. Then it goes on to say, For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be uh, a glory in the midst of her. So notice uh, once again that... Uh, it starts with the, the angel saying it, and then it ends with the Lord saying that he's going to do it. And so uh, we see the work is the same. Your book also mentions that angels, uh, uh, the angel performs works that only God could do. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, it's, it's the angel. It says, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. All right. And it's the angel of the Lord uh, rebuking him. All right. So Zechariah 3, 4 says, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And of course, this is Joshua the high priest who's uh, clothed in sinful garments. And it's the angel of the Lord that's defending him, kind of almost like a lawyer. But he says, I have, I have allowed, it says, uh, I have caused the iniquity to pass from thee. And it's the angel of the Lord talking. Uh, verse 7 goes on to say, If thou wilt walk in my ways, then thou shalt also judge my house. And it's the angel of the Lord talking. And yet he's claiming the house of Israel 
and uh, the, those kind of things. And so uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, different proofs there. Notice it says uh, this angel exercised divine prerogative of judgment. The angel of the Lord also uh, tends to judge things. In 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 15, uh, it says, And God sent the angel uh, unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the, Jebu uh, the Jebusite. And then, of course, we know that David goes out and offers a sacrifice uh, and, and offers a sin offering there for his sin. All right, so we see that that angel is the judging angel of God. By the way, we know many scriptures that talk about the fact that Jesus will bring judgment. All right? Uh, look at Psalm 35, verse 5 and 6. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. So once again, we see uh, judgment there. Second uh, Kings chapter 19, verse 35. The angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. He killed 185,000. That was the angel of the Lord. And we mentioned that uh, last, uh, last lesson there. Uh, but very possibly that is Jesus Christ himself uh, doing those things. Uh, because Jesus Christ uh, unto him is committed the judgment. And so uh, very, very possibly. All right, uh, so we've got uh, some specific angels. We've got Lucifer. We've got Michael. We've got Gabriel. And then we've got this, the angel of the Lord. Uh, very likely Jesus Christ, uh, pre-incarnate uh, of Jesus Christ. I did mention the Judges uh, passage. Like I said, I believe it's 80 times the angel of the Lord's mentioned. It's kind of interesting. Uh, in Joshua, the angel of the Lord's not mentioned that, that often. And yet in Judges, it's mentioned more than I think any other book in the Bible, 80 times. It really kind of shows us that, uh, you know, when we are backslidden, sometimes God is even more present in our life trying to get us back with him and kind of an interesting uh, correlation there notice letter e in your book there it says other uh, specifically uh, designated angels there are certain angels that are designated over certain things and there's one angel here that is given a name as well that we're going to cover so there is one more named angel uh, but notice uh, there's angels of judgment uh, number one there in your book and they're mentioned uh, several times in the bible genesis and second samuel as well as psalms there are watcher angels. There are angels that watch things that go on. Daniel chapter 4, verse 13. Of course, that was when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was given the vision that he was going to be cut down. And uh, Daniel said, look, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to humble yourself and you need to uh, do right. And for about 12 months, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar did all right. He humbled himself a little bit, but then he got proud. And he said, oh, is this Babylon, this great Babylon that I have built? And it says the watchers, the watchers were there and uh, they were ready. Uh, notice it says the angel of the abyss. Let's look at that. Uh, Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Because this is another angel that actually is named. Uh, not many named angels, but uh, Revelation chapter 9, we see another angel named uh, called the angel of the abyss. Look at uh, verse number uh, 11, it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now it mentions this angel of the abyss, and oftentimes, and I've heard this many, many times, um, it will call uh, Satan. They'll say, well, Satan is Apollyon or Abaddon. He is the angel of bottomless pit. All right. Uh, if you read the context of that passage, I do not believe that Apollyon or Abaddon, uh, depending on whether you're talking Hebrew or Greek, I do not believe that is the devil. Uh, first of all, um, we, we sometimes get this improper motion that hell is the headquarters of the devil and heaven is the headquarters of God. All right, hell is not the devil's headquarters. The devil does not want to go to hell. He does not want to go to the lake of fire. 
He is not some, uh, you know, red creature with a, a pitchfork, uh, you know, ruling over a hell. He is not the ruler of hell. In fact, uh, he is not looking forward to the day when he is cast into the lake of fire. He doesn't want to go there. All right. What we have in, in uh, Revelation chapter 9 is there is a special angel named Abaddon, or in Greek, Apollyon. By the way, Apollyon means destroyer. Very, very likely could even be uh, the very destroyer angel that uh, uh, destroyed there in, in Israel, mentioned uh, uh, the angel of the Lord there, also mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the Passover angel, very possibly the destroyer angel. And he is the angel of the bottomless pit. Uh, by the way, in that passage, there's some very, uh, uh, I wouldn't use the word demonic because they're not necessarily bad, but there's uh, creatures that are, that, that are released, and, and these creatures are tormentors of hell. By the way, hell is made for the devil and his angels. They are meant to be punished there in hell. And these creatures that Apollyon is in charge of are creatures that are designed to torment demons. They're some pretty bad guys, all right? And so Apollyon is a, a judgment, uh, an angel of judgment. He is the king over the bottomless pit. He is the one, it doesn't mention him by name, uh, but I believe, probably Revelation chapter 20, it says that there is one angel, an angel, it says, that takes a chain and bounds Satan and uh, cast him into hell for a thousand years. One angel. And by the way, we mentioned in the last lesson that, that uh, Lucifer, uh, Satan, is a cherubim. He's a pretty big boy. All right? Uh, very likely 15 feet tall with a 15-foot wingspan. If, uh, if what they built in the temple was to scale, nonetheless very big, very strong. And yet, in the Bible, Revelation chapter 20, uh, we see that there is one angel... Uh, that that chains him up and drags him off to hell. Uh, I think very likely Apollyon, uh, the king of the bottomless pit. All right, uh, notice your book mentions uh, angels which had power over fire, Revelation chapter 14. There's angels that have power over water, Revelation chapter 16. And so you see there are some, you might say, domains here where uh, these different angels operate. Angels of judgment, seven angels of judgment, Revelation chapter 8. All right, um, we already mentioned this one, but the angel that has the key to the bottomless pit, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, your book says that very possibly this could be Michael the archangel, and maybe it could be, might be. Uh, some people think that it might be Jesus himself, kind of as the angel of the Lord. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, whatever the case is, there is an angel that is over the bottomless pit, and he puts uh, Satan away uh, for a thousand years, and then eventually forever. Uh, notice a strong angel mentioned in Revelation chapter 5, a mighty angel mentioned in Revelation chapter 10, and then it says angels having great power in Revelation chapter 18. And so we see uh, uh, lots of different uh, angels. We talked about the classification of angels. Uh, we see there a couple of angels that are specifically named. And so, uh, so we will finish there with that chapter 8.2 and uh, looking forward to 8.3. I uh, hope you'll continue to work on your, your scripture verses there, Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 through 6, and verse 19. And we'll see you uh, next time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the time in your word. I pray that you'd bless uh, this time. Help us to, uh, uh, to gain these truths and remember them, uh, Lord, from your word. In Jesus' name, amen.